Welcome to Section 420, Talking Yankees. My next guest is Anika Orock. She's an award-winning illustrator, cartoonist, storyteller, and writer. And she's here with us today to tell us how she turned her childhood passion of baseball and art into a fulfilling career. Hi, Anika. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And you're very accomplished. You're an award-winning um, illustrator. You're a cartoonist, a storyteller, um, you know, a Jane of all trades. Uh, so thanks again for you know, coming <laughs> on to the show. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, there are now, plenty of things I can't do. <laughs> no, no, I, maybe, but no, you see, drawing, you definitely got that down. And people can follow you on Twitter. It's at Anika Draws, as well as check out your website with all this cool stuff, which we're going to talk about, um, Anika uh, orock.com and again try to check that out so i'm um, gonna get into your book um again the incredible women of the all-american girls professional baseball league uh which is again kind of half and half of half storytelling and half illustration as well as another book that you um uh, recently uh were involved with where you just did an illustration let's just get into you as a person like uh, where you're from where'd you grow up and how'd you become this uh you know multi-talented artist <laughs> well thank you um well, I grew up, uh, my family is from the Bay Area of California, but when I was little, um, we moved to Utah. So that was, uh, my parents worked for the airlines. So they closed the, the base in San Francisco and we moved there. So that, that made um, it challenging to be a baseball fan. I guess I was a Giants fan growing up. And um, there is a great minor league team in Salt Lake City, but, um, you know, I was a Giants fan. So I was very close with my grandparents out there and, and all my dad's side of the family. So um, my, my grandparents and I would, you know, we would keep tabs on giants games through the phone. Basically that's, that's how we did that. And then I would spend a lot of weekends and, and summers with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I've drawn as long as I can even remember. I really don't even remember not drawing. It just has kind of always been part of me or what I do or what I always wanted to do, but drawing in, in this, the storytelling sense. So I guess story has always been um, an element of what I do and what I love. I grew up with a couple of really great storytellers. My grandfather was a great storyteller. My dad tells a great story. My grandfather was a writer. Um, he was a daily newspaper columnist. So he was, you know, he he made storytelling an art form from from the most basic everyday things to um, you know to fiction to whatever. He he wrote a lot about baseball as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I think my real, uh, when I really thought or knew it's what I really wanted to do right around, well, I guess like elementary school, fifth grade, sixth grade, um, I knew I wanted to, to do something with it. I wasn't quite sure what, and then, um, in seventh grade, a guy who it's so funny, he seemed so, <laughs> he seemed so old and grown up to me, but he was, I think he was in like his early thirties. He opened a, um, like an animation art gallery like a, a store gallery in a strip mall that was right in between my junior high and my house and um he had like all kinds of you know like original disney cells and sketches and stuff from warner brothers i mean all the Hanna Barbera, everything but um and i was so interested in that kind of stuff as a kid already and then when he opened that and, you know, the first time I went in there, there's like original art from, you know, Peter Pan and Sleeping Beauty and Warner Brothers cartoons. And I was just like, I was just blown away. So the guy was nice enough to let me come there pretty much every day after school. I spent there for like at least a year or two. Um, and he let me set up like a little chair and I would just set up my chair and look at the things and draw them. And he would, he got all these like things coming through via fax through, I don't know, other people he knew that. Um, had access to like animation model sheets and things like that. And so that was kind of like my first, um, I guess, education, like self-education. That was stuff that, you know, now I think there's more of a channel for those kinds of things for people to get through, you know, animation and illustration. I think there's a little bit more of a defined route for people now. Um, but when I was that age, there really wasn't. I mean, there were some things you could do, but that was like, I had no idea you could work in animation or, you know, that you, that besides just animating, like actually animating, I, I, it wasn't even, I didn't even know you could have like a conceptual job or, um, you know, design characters or, you know, and, and when I started to learn about things like that is when I really got excited and interested in doing it. And, um, the baseball part kind of just sort of happened <laughs> later, later on while I was working in, um, animation, doing storyboarding, 
and that just took on a life of its own, which was really exciting and fun. But, um, yeah, so those two loves kind of came together maybe about six or seven years ago, but they've always been there. All right. And just quickly going back to your grandfather, when he was, uh, working with the newspaper, was he like covering the giants or was this kind of writing like the general baseball stories? He, you know, <laughs> he was one of those people, he was so damn lucky. He got to just write about whatever he wanted to write about. So it was a, a daily column of just kind of like, um, humor life, uh, you know, if, if there was like a particular celebrity coming into town that he loved back when he was a kid or something, they were coming through for like a show in San Francisco or something, he would interview them. Um, he would write about like goings on about town. He was kind of, if anyone uh, from the West Coast or from San Francisco knows of Herb Cain, um, it was kind of a lot like that. Um, he was actually, I think people nicknamed him like the East Bay Herb Cain. Um, but he definitely, he covered a lot of baseball and when he, he started his column in 1971. So he really took advantage of like the 1973 Oakland athletics being in the world series and, um, and went and covered that. Um, so sometimes when there was something going on, he would cover it, but he did write a lot of, um, you know, columns that were kind of like stories that happened at baseball games. He wrote one called Mark and the Togo sandwich which is about my uncle who was a teenager at the time, bringing a really messy barbecue beef sandwich to a baseball game. And Mark was not, <laughs> he's not the most graceful kid. And so it's just this story of this, like this horrendous sandwich at a baseball game, but um, you know, different, different things like that is just kind of the story element, which is what I really love about baseball and how that ended up in my work is that um, you know, if you ask me, what someone was hitting in any given year or, <laughs> you know, I mean like the numbers part of it, I'm an artist. So yeah. it's like, I, I, I make a terrible baseball fan in that way, but the story element and the his, you know, baseball history is just filled with stories that are just so fantastic. They're almost folkloric at a certain point, you know? Um, and that's, that's the part of it that I love. And that's the part that I love to share. And that was kind of, I think what he did as well with it. Yeah, I'm on the same page you right? I just think baseball in general just makes the most for stories, movies, drama. So getting back to yourself now, when was that period when like, whether it's a piece of art that you were commissioned for, or you sold, or you got a, a, a mention that you were like, wow, you know what, I've arrived, This I could do this, I'm, you know, I'm in this industry now. I don't even know if I have yet. <laughs> <laughs> You've done some great stuff. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think... It, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily a, a matter of arriving, but when it occurred to me, like, this is a thing and this could actually work is, um, you know, like I said, I was, I was doing some storyboarding work and I was living in Los Angeles and, you know, which is like for a Giants fan, that's like uh, the belly of the beast, <laughs> you know, but um, so I was, I, but the good thing was that the giants were in town a lot. So I listened to a lot of baseball and that's when the app was like fairly new, um, which was great. So I could listen to the giants broadcast wherever I was. And, uh, and I would, I would listen to games while I work, which I still do. But, um, there's, there's a thing about working in animation, which is great, but you're, you're often having to work in, in the style of whatever thing you're working on. And I was feeling kind of creatively stifled. Like I really have my own ideas. I have my own things I want to do. I want to work on my own story, working in my own style and kind of develop that. Cause you kind of even start to lose your own sense of style when you're working in all these different styles. So I started developing my own story just as like a creative outlet. And, um, a friend of mine would advise me to just choose something that I love. And he's like, well, I don't know anyone that loves baseball more than you do. You should do a baseball story. So I started working on, on that. And because of, I was doing that just recreationally, you know, I was doing my own research and stuff. So it was kind of a great excuse to watch more baseball and listen to more baseball and draw. Um, you know, I just started drawing at game. Like I went to a few games and would draw at the games, which is something I never had done before. And now it's, and now I do that all the time. Um, and I, I started posting it just for fun. And that's when I was kind of like, Oh, wow. Like, Baseball, I had no idea that baseball people are also like baseball people love baseball art or, you know, that those, the two things really like go well together. Um, and I posted a drawing of, I did a caricature of Madison Bumgarner and um, I think it was, 
I don't remember if John Miller had reposted something of mine before that, but he reposted that. Um, and I didn't know him. Like it was incredible. It was like, he was like the voice I grew up with, you know, really like he, he came to the giants in 97 and that was shortly before I moved back to San Francisco. And, and that was when the new ballpark was built. So that like, I really became a, a baseball fan, like around 16, 17 years old. So even though Lon Simmons and Russ Hodges had been the voice I grew up with as a kid with my grandparents, when I really got into it, John Miller was that voice. And so that was like a really big deal for me that he reposted that. But when he reposted it, it like, <laughs> it just kind of like exploded. And the people were asking me if I had prints and, and, you know, going on and on. Um, but I had been doing like other little baseball drawings and things. And it just, it was like a social media thing. It just kind of like took on this life of its own. So I thought, well, I'll make some prints. So I'll make a handful and I'll sell them. And they were gone like that. And, and it just, that whole thing kind of kept snowballing. So I just kept doing it because I was having so much fun with it. Um, and then doing illustrations of just being, being a fan. So like images I had of growing up um, as a baseball fan, like the radio being present all the time. Um, I think it, uh, there was a time I went to a baseball game where there was a whole bunch of nuns sitting behind me. So that inspired an illustration I did of a bunch of nuns at a baseball game and um, just various aspects of being a baseball fan. And and I had so much fun with those and same thing. Those just kind of took on a life of their own. And when it really sunk in was, um, uh, John Miller had invited me to a game, which was really awesome. And then several games later, um, I was just working in my studio and he sent me a message saying that Dave Fleming was on assignment and he had the broadcast booth to himself. So if I wanted to come and draw, <laughs> and of course, like I was, 45 minutes away by train. So I jumped on the train and, um, had all my art supplies and I was just sitting in the broadcast booth drawing and he is sitting there calling the game. And I have this incredible view and all my art supplies and my snacks. It was like, I was five years old again. Like I have all my, <laughs> my art supplies and my snacks and everything. Only here I am in this spot and, um, able to, you know, sell those drawings. I, I sell a lot of my original game drawings too. And, and that was when it was just kind of like, this is a thing. Like I'm able to do this. Um, and you know, it, it just, the, the connection between baseball fans and baseball art is something I didn't even know existed until I started doing it. And it's a really cool community. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a privilege to be able to do what I do and like it and have other people be interested in it, <laughs> you know, and have it work. I think that's like the icing on top. That's great. That's actually that's a great, amazing story. Just what a, a repost could do. So let, let's get into uh, the book, which again, you wrote and illustrated uh, the incredible women of the all American girls professional baseball league um, from 2020. So uh, give us a background. I guess, you know, you've been doing these drawings, but what made, made you put this book together and specifically want to tell this story or these little stories all kind of put together? Well, it really came from those moments where I was drawing at baseball games and, and several people, again, kind of it taking on a life of its own people asking, um, are you going to do a book? And I just threw together like a quick self-published thing of the drawings I had done so far, um, just to kind of for, for something fun to do. And I actually really needed something <laughs> to sell at a show that I had um, committed to having a table at and I didn't, I didn't have anything to sell. I was like, well, I guess I just should make something to sell. So I was going through all of my drawings that I had done at ballparks and, and different little illustrations I had done. And I had a stack maybe like this big of, of drawings. And I realized going through them, how few of them had women in them. And it was such a weird thing. It, it was weird in hindsight, it's weird to me that I didn't realize it before, but then it was also a weird thing to, to realize visually, like, and it kind of just occurring to me. And, and then I just kind of, it was like, my brain just started going, wait a minute. And I started considering my own experiences and how few women I encountered in certain areas of the ballpark, like the broadcast level and, and different people I was being introduced to. And I started just kind of thinking of all the moments I'd had as a woman working in this little world. And, um, it just suddenly, I felt like, I feel like I should be telling stories about women in baseball or at least knowing about them. I didn't even know any. And the only thing I knew was a league of their own. So I guess in a way it's kind of like, I, I, I didn't stray too far from the first story I knew, but also once I dug in, you know, I watched a league of their own. And then I started doing some like Google searches 
And it was just this like endless rabbit hole. The real stories were so compelling and so interesting and fun. And also I noticed myself identifying with these stories. So I noticed, um, you know, even though they happened so long ago, these women grew up in the twenties and thirties, but there was some element to their growing up that I started identifying with and understanding and finding interesting, especially for that time. And it just, there was so much more to these stories than can even be gotten from a two hour movie, let alone one that's kind of been, you know, decorated <laughs> a little bit for Hollywood, which is great. I mean, it's an incredible movie and um, it did great things for these women and, and it made their existence known as a league. But um, there was just so much more to it. And I and the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn and the more I realized that I, I needed to learn. So I just kind of dove in and I pitched the idea to Chronicle Books. I, they were the only publisher I sent the idea to. Uh, and it really was just I just did it to kind of get my feet wet and have the experience of pitching to an actual publisher and not just like doing my own thing. Um, and m- much to my surprise, they wanted to do it. So um, but my idea was very different from what it actually ended up being. Um, And the editor said, you know, your idea is great, but it was really just going to be a collection of stories. And she said, you know, it's been like over 25 years since the movie has been made. There's like a whole generation of girls that are now adults that don't know that movie and they don't, you know, and so we really just kind of want to tell the whole story and the whole history. So then I really had to dive in (laughs) It was a lot more work than, than I, than I bargained for, but I wouldn't change a thing. It was incredible. It was such a great experience. Um, you know, interviewing those women, um, researching the history of that league and then opening all these other doors about women in baseball. I mean, this, this chapter, the all American girls professional baseball league, um, it it's literally just a chapter in the history of women playing baseball, umpiring baseball, working in baseball, scouting baseball. I mean, they've, they've been around and in it since it existed is just um they don't really have that platform or that voice or that you know their stories are not at the forefront of of baseball history or consciousness and for a lot of these former athletes i'm like just by the time you were connect- connecting with them they must have been up there in age and like so how are you able to actually find out who they are and reach out to them and you know and uh, get to speak to them uh well one of the very fortunate things is that a lot of them still know each other they 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 did all the work for me (laughs) on their own as far as that's concerned um they still had you know when i was researching this i discovered oh my god they still have annual reunions like these women who the women who can still get together um and you know there's i mean there's a players association so they are still um involved with one another they get newsletters they stay in touch with one another Uh, they've been working together for quite a while to um find a designated place for a lot of their memorabilia. If it doesn't go to the baseball hall of fame, you know, they've, um, they've been working together on a lot of things um, and mostly just to stay in contact with one another. So there are several women, I think there were over 600 that played at some point over the duration of the league's existence. Um, And of the women that were known about or who knew each other, you know, hundred, a couple few hundred of them um, started having an annual reunion, um, back in the eighties. And then as they've, you know, gotten older and unfortunately several have passed away. Uh, you know, I, I was really lucky. I went to, I think 2017 was the first reunion I attended and I didn't know a soul. I didn't even know you could just, anyone could just go. And I just, Mm. (laughs) it was so far outside my comfort zone, but it was really cool. And, um, there were probably about, I want to say maybe like 30 women there at that reunion. And I've been to every reunion they've had since. Unfortunately, they didn't have one last year and there won't be one this year. But there's there's a lot of talk of, of that being the last one. Or if they have another one, it, it probably will be the last one because so many of them have passed away since. But through that association, they were kind enough to, even the women who couldn't make the reunions, um, I was able to get a lot of a, a hold of a lot of them over the phone. Um, some of them over email, uh, I traveled to some of them. So I went to some of the original cities where, where the original four teams started the league. So that would be South Bend, Indiana, which also at, at university of Notre Dame has, uh, uh, like a, an archive there, um, and Rockford, Illinois, um, 
you know, racing Wisconsin. So a lot of the women stayed kind of in those general areas of where they played. Um, so I did travel to speak with some of them, a lot of them over the phone. Um, but it was just, it was a pleasure. However, I was able to do it. They were just a delight to speak with. And unfortunately, like more than half of the women that I had a chance to interview, um, even over the phone or in person have passed, have since passed away. So I feel like I, I really got lucky and that I, you know, we're so lucky that we still have several of them with us, but, um, yeah, I, 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 time was really kind of of the essence. So I'm really lucky that Chronicle was willing to do it. And and that was also why I had to really bust my rear, (laughs) you know, they, Mm. I could have extended it. I could have, you know, they would have given me more time, but I just felt like, um, I really need to speak to as many of these women as possible as soon as possible. Uh, and I really, you know, got in under the wire, especially with COVID and these, these reunions being canceled. Um, I feel like I just got, just got in and got to know some of these women at a, at a really great time. And I'm, I'm sure the answer is several of them, but is there one interaction or just meeting or interview uh, that just stood out for you? That was just an incredible story or just an incredible person just to communicate with that just, again, really kind of stands top of your mind. Oh yeah. Uh, well, there are several, and there are several memorable interviews. Um, one interview that I really enjoyed, I was in a really weird, crappy motel room in Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> it was like really creepy, uh, like stuff that like some sort of HBO show would be made out of, but, um, and I phoned, um, uh, Marge Callahan. So she, they're two, Cal- the two Callahan sisters, um, Helen Callahan's son made the documentary A League of Their Own, which inspired Penny Marshall to make the movie. So the the char- the lead characters are kind of loosely based on these women. And I got to speak with Marge for a while. She was in Canada and she was just a delight. And we ended up talking for about two hours and that was a really fun and funny interview. And she has since passed away, unfortunately. But um, one of the most interesting ones that really stands out is Jean Fout. She's a pitcher. Um, one of the greatest pitchers, I think, of all time, if you're, if you're going to talk pitchers, um, in any professional league, but she's the only pitcher, I think a man or a woman to, to pitch two perfect games in her career. And she is almost entirely deaf. She's very hard of hearing. So I was able to interview her in her, in her hotel room during one of the reunions. And, um, that was just such an interesting experience. She was very, she was great. She had great answers, but we had to sit very close. I had to speak very slowly so she could see what I was saying. So it was a little bit tricky and she gave kind of, kind of simple, not too terribly detailed answers, but she did this thing that a lot of the women did at a certain point in the interview where they were maybe like a little reluctant to talk or just not really, um, you know, just giving kind of basic answers. And then at some point something would click where like the memories would start to kick in and suddenly they would get fired up and start really sharing stories. So like pretty much when I was on my way out of Jean's hotel room, she remembered this story and she started telling it and it was like something just came over her and she started acting out this story and it's in a comic panel in the book. It's a comic strip panel. Let's quickly get into the other book you're involved in. It looks like you collaborated with uh, Malika Underwood. I just want to give us maybe just a quick little summary of, of you know that recent project. Yeah, sure. Well, I had the pleasure of speaking with Malika. Um, I, I chose to write an, write an afterward to the incredible women because um, there was just a lot of parallels. I was noticing that, you know, we haven't had a professional women's baseball league in, you know, since it folded in 54, but there's still like so many parallels. And I just started to ask the question, why hasn't this happened? So, um, in speaking with Malika, you know, we just, um, we really hit it off and she has, um, now two little girls and we really got to talking about the importance of instilling certain things, uh, early on and allowing girls the opportunity, uh, to play baseball if they want to. There is softball, but there are a lot of girls who want to play baseball and there's that wall there. So um, we got to talking and she had this idea for a board book, like an early toddler board book called Birdie Can Too, which is Birdie sees a man playing baseball. She knows she can too. And and the story goes from there. Um, And that was really fun. Malika wrote it and I did the illustrations and we are contemplating um, a series moving forward of more Birdie books. So we'll see. We'll see where that goes. That would be fun. All right. And just as we wrap up, um, is there any advice you would give? Like, again, you said the whole animation and illustration 
industry may be a little more formalized, but just any advice to someone, a young person, uh, maybe looking to get into that, what, what, what would you recommend or what would you, what would, what advice would you give? Oh, there are so many things, but I think the biggest thing that I wish I had known or that someone would have told me is literally just, I mean, keep drawing, but just do you do what excites you and do what you love and get out and draw what you see, draw what you love. Um, there's a lot of, I think, pressure. A lot of people think that they have to have a style and their style, you know, they try to emulate other styles or mimic certain styles or popular styles, or you have to fit into a style. And really people, a lot of people ask, how do you get your own style? And it really just is just keep drawing, but keep drawing what you love, do what you like, because that enthusiasm, that excitement is what really actually comes through. And that will define your, your, it'll take care of itself. That will define your style. Yeah, and lastly, now, obviously we've seen women in, now in terms of major league baseball, uh, a lot of inroads now we have, uh, you know, whether it's in general manager's office, now some coaches and they're talking about umpiring stuff like that. But um, I mean, do you think we'll see a woman a manager for a team or a woman umpire behind the plate, you know, in the near future? I really hope so. I mean, I think that we've got all of the, the, the women with the skills and the talent, they're there. Um, it's really just a matter of the right doors opening. And I think we're finally seeing some of those doors opening. Alyssa Nacken with the Giants, Kim Ng uh, with the Marlins. Those are great examples of just they've been ready and capable and able for a long time. And it's really just a matter of, of people willing, being willing to open the right doors and let them in. Um, umpiring is a whole different beast. And there are some very talented female umpires out there that I think um, – you know, absolutely could be behind the plate in a major league game. What I would really love to see is like a women's league. Um, I think that would just be the best way for the sport to grow and for women to not to have a channel to be able to play baseball without having that pressure of being the only one and having to be better than every man around them just to just to have a place um, to play. I think I think that would be that would really open things up for girls and women. I agree. So, uh, Anika or Orak, again, thank you once again for uh, you know, coming on again, people can follow you on Twitter at Nika draws, as well as check out the website with all this cool stuff, the books, the illustration, uh, some of the other you know, uh, press coverage you've gotten at Anika Orak.com. So again, thank you for once again for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I will say I, really quick because you're in the area, um, I guess it's in the area. The Wor the Worcester Art Museum in Worcester, Massachusetts has a really awesome exhibit right now called the Iconic Jersey. And it's all about like the history and fashion, all the, everything to do with baseball jersey. They were nice enough to use some of my art and um, in the catalog and, you know, be a part of it. But I, I have yet to go. I'm excited to go this summer, but it looks really cool. It's something that I think a lot of people, baseball fans in the area might be interested in. All right, look it up, but I don't have to let me in. I got this Bronx shirt on. I don't have to let me out of Massachusetts. <laughs>